Camp is one of the missions that we support. We had Mark last week, and we support her. The camp is also one we've been in support for years and years. Russ and Rebecca have been played a huge role in that camp through the years, and uh, um, we want to support that. So thank you. If you have a grandchild or a child that is interested in camp at all, um, it's just a great week. You can tell by the pictures. They're out having fun. They're, the, it's just a tremendous opportunity. I, I went to camp in a, uh, an old military base at Louisville, Louisville, Nebraska, I mean, it was nothing like this. I think there were like two trees on the whole campus, you know. But we couldn't wait each year to go to camp. I mean, it was just my some of my best friends even today uh, went to that camp, and and um, so I believe strongly in camp, and I know Ben does too. That's where Ben made a decision uh, to give his life to Jesus Christ. So I'm sure it holds a special value to him as well. And I know we have some even here today that were baptized in in the in the lake there, and so anyway, there's information out there, and if you have any questions at all about camp, just get a hold of Ben. The church does pay half scholarships towards that if your son or daughter or grandson is involved in our church at all, because um, we believe in, in that mission. So that'll be coming up starting in June, but uh, now's the time to register. Today we wrap up this short little three-week series on what really matters, the heart of the matter, and, and we've discovered that people matter, and um, that's what we've been talking about. And um, sometimes we get our priorities off, or sometimes we, sometimes we're just distracted. I mean, it's, I'm sure it's happened to you. Maybe just the pastor. But sometimes someone says, "Hey, let's get together," and you say, "Okay, we'll do it." Well, you forget it's. The first night of March Madness, and you scheduled to be with someone, and you're like, oh, I'd rather be watching a basketball game. And then it comes down to what really matters. Do people matter, or do that basketball game matter? And maybe we can meet somewhere, and I can kind of watch the TV while we're having supper or something. You know, you, am I the only one that ever does that, you know? And sometimes people matter until something matters more. Ever had that happen? You know, the Packers are on. Ah, uh, God, what am I going to do? Jesus demonstrates that people matter more than many of those things. Not that any of those things are wrong. We're not saying that. Uh, but sometimes it's just easy to let those things slide. And, and people really matter. And it's not that my neighbor doesn't matter. It's not that my work doesn't matter. It doesn't. My kids don't. Like, sometimes. See what I'm saying? Hopefully this series has bumped up people in our priority list because they really matter. And um, they matter, today we're just going to be talking about, they matter a great deal. They matter no matter what. No matter what. No matter what that the game is on, they matter. Sports teams sometimes pick slogans for the year and some have, some have put no matter what. Maybe they lost the championship last year. This year we're going to get there no matter what. We're going to do whatever it takes to get there. Unfinished business, they might say. Whatever it takes, and they might make a t-shirt that says, whatever it takes, we're going to do whatever it takes, no matter what. Sometimes that gets us in trouble. Sometimes we will do no matter what, whatever it takes. You know, Lance Armstrong will take performance enhancing drugs because no matter what I'm going to win the Tour de France. Sometimes it takes us too much. But today we're going to get to see that we matter no matter what to Jesus. And hopefully he matters no matter what to us. Barbara and I get this little magazine, you, some of you probably get it as well, it's uh, Voice of the Martyrs. It just talks about the persecuted church. And I just want to read a little bit, it's kind of scary. Um, but it's something I pray for and, and just thought I'd share with you today. The Chinese Communist Party has created a digital monster whose eyes never cease watching Chinese citizens and whose brain tracks and automatically punishes their infractions. In 2018, China had 350 million surveillance cameras, or roughly one camera for every four people. This year, the number is expected to exceed 580 million in an astonishing one camera for every two people in the country. In the past three years, the CCP, Chinese Communist Party, has used technology to facilitate the mass incarceration of more than 1.5 million ethnic, religious, and political minorities. 
goes on to say they use that to track people, whose homes they go to, where they go, anybody that's trying to oppose power or the control that they have gets a low index, social index score. Uh, in China, foundational aspects of biblical faith and practice such as gathering for worship and discipling children are crimes. Our Chinese Christian brothers and sisters live with the understanding that attending a church service or visiting a fellow Christian's home even once can lower their permanent digital record. Despite the oppressive environment, Chinese believers remain faithful, knowing that there is an infinitely more important and truly permanent record in the mind of our Heavenly Father. Goes on to say and wraps up, a Chinese Christian leader recently told us that he disciples the members of his church by telling them, of course the government is watching you and even listening to you in your own home. So make sure that what they are seeing is a true disciple of Christ. Goes on to say, let us stand with Christ and obey the precepts in his word at any cost, no matter what. No matter what. Christians in other parts of the country have harder decisions when it comes to their faith than we do. And they have to say, I'm going to follow Jesus no matter what. No matter that it might cost me. Might, I might be trapped. I don't know if we'll ever get there. But it just fits right in with what we're talking about. No matter what. Do we have a faith that says, I will follow Jesus no matter what? Most of us have an experience of love that loves us no matter what. We have a love, even sometimes even in the best of marriages. I love you if, if you take out the garbage, if you do this, and there's something in return. Even if you go check out the greeting cards in the, in the wherever you buy your card, that most of the time there's like a condition. It's not, I just love you no matter what, I'll love you if. Right now, our little grandson who we got to see yesterday, I love him no matter what. Now, there might be a coming I'll say, I love you if, But we live in a world where I love you if I love you because. Because you did something for me, I love you back. But Jesus says, I love you no matter what. And when you experience that type of love, it changes who you are. We've been looking at the book of Mark, and we're we'll going to continue there. But this story that we're looking at today is very familiar. In fact, we just visited it not very long ago in similar fashion on Easter um, Jesus had lots of encounters with lots of different people all throughout his Gospels. And this morning we're going to look at one more. And it just says to us very clearly, you matter, no matter what. There was a Roman centurion. We didn't know his name. We still don't know his name. We don't know a lot about him. But we know in order to become a Roman centurion, you have to be very bright. And you have to be one of the best of the best to, in order to receive that rank, that job closes that. He would have authority. His job mattered to him. He would never have achieved the status of centurion had his job not mattered. Roman centurions opposed the Jews. They had no time for the Jews. They didn't like them. They despised them. And um, so they would have been considered useless much like a dog, one commentary compared to that. And so the centurion would have been in charge of the executions, the crucifixions. And so he probably woke up that day of his crucifixion when Jesus was crucified, and he said, just another day. Well, his wife might have said, hey, what's going on today? What's, oh, just another day. We're just killing another insurrection of somebody great in trouble, another Jew. But we'll deal with him. Another one killed on a cross. There's no doubt that Jesus mattered very little, if at all, to this Roman centurion. It was all business as usual. Pilate gives order to the centurion, have this man flogged and beaten. We know the story. We know he was beaten, flogged. We know there was a crown of thorns put on his head. We know he was stripped of his clothing. Humiliating. I also read there were six out of ten didn't even survive the flogging, the beating. They died before they could even put them on the cross. We know some of the details, and they're gruesome. We know what the whips were made of. We know from seeing visual recreations how awful that would have been. An understatement. We could go on and, and describe 
what his flesh might have looked like and all that. We know that. But this gruesome death matters, and it gives us great insight into what we've been talking about. It, it just screams, you matter. People matter to me, no matter the cost. What he endured, we know, was not forced upon him. It was his choice. He went willingly, an obedient spirit. And so it was love of a father, love for you and me, that took him to the cross. He could have escaped it. He had angels at his disposal. The Bible says legions of angels. He could have just said, now's the time. They were ready. They had to come. They had to come. What mattered so much to Jesus that he went through all those things? upon, mocked, again, a crown of thorns, heads bleed a lot, just the way we're designed, so when those thorns got pushed on his head, blood would have been pouring down. What mattered so much that he would endure all those things? Why? Jesus didn't matter to the centurion, but the centurion would have had front row seats to this crucifixion. He'd have been right there at the foot of the cross. And something happened during this crucifixion that changed his perspective at least somewhat. I mean, think of what he saw because of his positioning there at the foot of the cross. We're going to read from Mark. Originally, I was going to read Matthew. Goes there's parts of Matthew that I like well, but we've been in Mark so much, I, I decided to stay with Mark. But uh, it's, it's, a, it's a little lengthy, but I think it just fits into what we're doing. Why? What mattered so much to Jesus that he endured some of these things? Starting in verse 16. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace. That is the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of Jews. And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him, mocking him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus to carry this cross, and they brought him to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right, one on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled that says he was numbered among the transgressors. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priest with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He can't save himself. Let Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified him, uh, with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lima sabachne, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders heard it saying, behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that it, in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man is the Son of God. 
Mark doesn't include a couple statements of Jesus that are really important here. Jesus says in a loud voice, I, I don't know if it was loud or not, I think it was, it is finished. The centurion would have heard those words. He would have heard Jesus say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Could it have been that way he died that brought the centurion to the point where he said, truly this man was the Son of God, which goes against everything they had been leading to, everything they'd been instructed, and he changes his mind. Truly, this man was the Son of God. This wouldn't have been a new recruit, a new centurion that hadn't seen something nasty before. This was a well-seasoned man who had seen death before. So it wasn't this shocking death where he, had been a, he would have been familiar with that. What was it that caused the centurion to go, truly, this man was the Son of God? Maybe it was the fact that Jesus didn't fight him. Maybe it was the fact that when it came to throw him on a cross, he helped him out. I'm sure every other one would have been cursing him and, and, and whatever energy they had left after falling, they probably would have bucked up and fought the soldiers as best they could. I think Jesus just said, let me help you out. Maybe it was that willingness. He never fought. He never cursed. He never argued with them. He never said. He just did it willingly. Maybe that was it. Maybe it was when he heard, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Except this would have been strange and unknown to the centurion. He didn't know what was happening. Maybe it was when he saw his mom and he, he made precautions for his mom, even on the cross, that he came. That had to have been unusual. <laughs> Maybe it was. The words that impact you and me, 2,000 years. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Powerful. That's a no matter what type of love. Maybe. He began to see Jesus. Maybe it was the, the eyes of Jesus. They just pierced him. And he says, you matter to me. And maybe those things all added up to bring this top of the line soldier to the place where he says, sure. This was the sun. Maybe it was the darkness or even creation had to scream out. You see, Jesus had this no matter type of love. And he still offers that to you and me. No matter if you're running from him, he still loves you. No matter if you've drifted far from him, he still loves you. No matter your past, and each of us has a past, whether that was recent, whether that was a long time ago, no matter. been talking about the last couple weeks. We can't change his love for us. Father, forgive them. And so we want to be a church that models what Jesus is like. We want to be that no matter type of love church. No matter where you've been, no matter where you're at, we want to love you. We want to introduce you this Jesus Christ. We don't want to be a church where certain people matter. Some people matter. Matters because of your gender, matters because of your age, matters because of how much money you have. Matters. I mean, we could go on and on. We don't want to be that church. We want to be a church where everybody matters. Why? That doesn't come naturally for us. We want to be that church because that's what Jesus wants our church to be. And no matter where you've been, no matter where you're at, we're going to love you. You matter to Jesus, therefore you matter to us. And so I think that's what sort of led this centurion to come to the place where it was truly. That means, in our language today, we, 
for sure, for sure, this was the Son of God. I don't know if you've ever tried to price an item. Maybe you handmade something. I've talked to others. I make furniture or woodworking through the years. And sometimes it's really hard to price something. Sometimes when we have the harvest of talents or something like that, it's hard to put a price on because you pour time and time and effort and you don't know what it's worth. You know how many hours it took you to build that or to make that or prepare that or to cook that and you're trying to put a tag on it, but if you put a tag on what it's worth, you're probably not going to get it. Anybody with me on that? Have you ever done that? And it's hard to put a value on something because you know you can't sell whatever it is you made, a little scarf, for $80 because no one's going to pay it. Or will they? No. You probably heard it. My friend told me as I was trying to figure out a price for something. He says, well, what you have is only worth what someone will pay for it. That's what determines the value, doesn't it? It's only as valuable as what someone will pay for it. You know where I'm going with this. The cross. That's God's communication to what we're worth. How do you put a value on that? How much is someone willing to pay for it? That's the value of the cross. Jesus loved you and me and the world enough. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He loved us enough to send his son. And his son said, I'll be obedient. I value my father. I value you that much. I'll be spit on. I'll wear the crown of thorns. I'll get laughed at. I'll get nailed between two thieves. I'll be misunderstood. That's what it costs. That's value. So how does God... How much does God really care? <clears throat> Enough to send his son for your sins and for mine and for the sins of the world. And so the cross is what we use to measure how much, how, how, what, what value is for people. How much, what a price tag. That's how much I'll send my son to endure. I would love to know the rest of the story. There are different theories on what happened to the centurion. Some thinks that in time he gave his life to Jesus, and I couldn't find a lot of information on that. I was really curious to see, because if he said, surely this man is the Son of God, something might have had to change. Maybe when the early church started, when Jesus ascended to heaven, Peter preached this sermon, and it was not politically correct. He said, basically, hey, you guys killed him. You hung him on a cross. And what happened to him when, when Peter preached it? They were convicted at the heart. Said, you guys did it. You, you crucified him. You can read it in Acts chapter 2, and he gives this sermon. He said, you guys killed him. I mean, what a great sermon. You did it. You own up. And maybe the centurion could have been in the crowd that day. I don't know. But maybe he was convicted. And when you're convicted of something, you have to do something, don't you? Have you ever been convicted of something? I can be convicted when I read what the Chinese Christians are going through. I'm convicted. I've got to do something. I've got to pray. I've got to give. I've got to do something. Maybe you've done that with different people. We see Marge go into Thailand. I'm convicted. I want to support her. When we're convicted of something... We have to do something. And that day in the early church, that very first sermon, they were convicted. You put them to death. They're like cut to the heart. Maybe the centurion was there. I don't know. And if he was, he had to do something about it. What must I do? What must I do? And that's what those who heard that first sermon said, what do I do? I'm convicted. You, I'm convicted. What What do I do? And Peter says, here's what you need to do. Repent. Be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And you should receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's it. What do I need to do? I'm convicted.
convicted. What should I do? They had to do something. And Peter says, this is it. Not that complicated. You ever been there? What do I do with what I did? What do I do with what I did? I know it was wrong. What do I do with that? That's what these people were dealing with. What do I do with it? And and Peter says, here's what you do. You say, God, I'm sorry. I repent. I change directions. I'm going to give my life to you in baptism. I'm making a change. It's not that complicated. It's not muddy. It's not unclear. In our world today, sometimes baptism gets confusing to people. We can make it say something or not say something, but that's what Scripture says, repent be baptized. Is that too much? Is that the end all? No. But you can't read Scripture without saying it's an important step in your faith process. Repent be baptized. And it's really interesting there. Um, it says that Peter knew that even years later we'd be struggling with baptism. And he says in verse 39 of the sermon, This promise is for you and for your children, for all who are far off, everyone who called, whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Repent. Be baptized. Live your life for Jesus Christ. Today we just looked at that story, and it really is just sort of, Sort of like what Ben and I did up here with the cross. It wasn't the centurion that we were imitating, but it was that, what do you do? He said he was the son of God. The centurion had no time, no care in the world for this despicable Jew, any Jew. And yet by the end of it, he said, surely, for sure, for sure, this man is the son of God. Many of us have made that commitment. Say, I too believe. Is the Son of God. We've gone through that where we were convicted, and when we're convicted, we have to say, What do I do with what I did? I did this in college, I did this, I did that, I, I gotta do something about that. I need forgiveness. And it's a simple repent. Give your life to Jesus Christ. Nothing demonstrates it more. Nothing demonstrates that you matter more than what we do each week in communion. And again, sometimes we do it so often that we lose the significance. But today is just a reminder. Think of all the things that Jesus endured because people matter. You matter. Those who don't see life the same as me, the same as you, matter. Those who have said wrongful things about you. They matter. Those who have different affiliations than you matter. Matter enough for Jesus to endure all those things we talked about. And so as we wind down, we're just going to invite you. Mom's going to come and just give us some music to play in the background. But I just want you to take a little extra time today uh, as we will have people go to the stations, you can pick up the cups. The bread, we know, significant, stands for the body that was broken. The blood is symbolized by the fruit of the vine, this grape juice that we use. And so I just want you to be reminded how much you matter. That your life matters. And sometimes we go through life, and sometimes the older we get, sometimes we think, my life doesn't matter, I don't, I can't do what I once did. Your life matters greatly. This is how much, this is the value, this is how much we know it's worth. Your life is worth that much. That God would send his son for you and for me and for those who are different than us. We'll pray. Take it back. Take an extra minute or two. Reflect on the things we talked about this morning. And then make a commitment. Recommit. I want to be a follower, just like the Chinese, no matter what. Those Christians over there are facing difficult times. Do I want to be that type of follower? Thank you, God, for what your son endured. We still have questions about it. But 
little by little we gain insight. We start to understand why it had to happen and why this took place. It took place, we know, because we matter. Had we not had a Savior come down and live among us and live this perfect life and go to the cross for our sins, there would be eternal separation. And we matter so much that this was the plan. So as we partake, help us just to recommit to love like Jesus loves. That people matter to you, therefore they matter to us. Especially those in the fellowship of the faith. And even those who are running from you or far from you. So just bless us the next two or three minutes as we partake. We pray in Jesus' name. Again, thankful that you've joined us today. <clears throat> Trust that this hour has just been something that's drawn you closer to your church family as well as to our Savior. Next week we'll start a new series called There's No Place Like Home. We're going to celebrate our moms next week. And so any moms that come will receive a little gift. And, and um, But there is no place like home. And so I, even the weeks to follow, we're just going to challenge our, our parenting and our grandparenting and and there's just no place like home to teach about sexuality. You got kids growing up in a confused world. There's no place like home to learn valuable things. Some of us have kids who have gone through. We go, oh, great. I'm just going to remind her what I didn't do. And that's easy for the pastor to think, oh, I should have done this. Or that. That's not what it's about. But we care about the family. But moms, next week, we're going to celebrate you. So I just invite you to come. Uh, we'll have a good time celebrating our moms, and uh, but we'll get ready for that series called There's No Place Like Home. Let's stand, and uh, we'll sing our closing song. Marlon will do this out for us. Have a great week. God's going to use Cassie in, in, <clears throat> excuse me, in special ways uh, to touch many, many lives. But uh, Cassie wants to share just briefly a little about her testimony, and after that we'll uh, have a baptism. So this morning, I didn't even know for sure if I was going to even say anything or not, and I was laying on my couch. My friend stayed the weekend, and I was just laying on my couch, looking up at my ceiling, thinking for a solid 30 minutes, just staring in space, and she comes in, and she's like, are you okay? You good? And I'm like, yeah, I'm just thinking, and then I just, I just decided.
kind of like, yeah, I should share, share a little something. So like a year ago, maybe like around this time, my faith was way up here. And I was actually planning on leaving for a mission trip. And then uh, it got canceled time and time again. And I just kept getting so dis discouraged. And things just kept happening in my life. Like it was punching me in the gut, like time after time. So my faith, it, like, it just kept coming down and down. And instead of going near to God, I was kind of like going away from him in a sense, uh, living for myself and not God. And so like, then eventually my faith got so low and it got so rough here a few a few months ago at work and just life in general. And like, it was not good. I was not myself. Even my mom made a comment the other day. She was like, it's so nice to see you be yourself again because I was not myself for a long time. And in that time when I was at my lowest is kind of when I was work started coming here. And that helped pick me back up, and I just, I'm so grateful and thankful to be part of this church. It's amazing to have that community and that love and support from everybody. Um, it's crazy, because like you know, I said, I was like living for myself and not for God. And now I want to live for God. I don't want to live for myself anymore. And like, I, I'm, I'm starting to go right even in my hair. So like, that's proof that you should not live for yourself. Because <laughs> I'm 22, I shouldn't be going great, but yeah, 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 I should be. <laughs> but I just, I want to be all in. I don't want to be like half in, half out. I just, I want to take that next step so that, because right now my faith is coming back up to where it was before. And I, I'm just so thankful for everybody here.